right, good morning. Hope you've all had a good weekend. Um, I want to start before we get into the material today. So, um, one of the things that I, that I hope that you um, that you take away you took away from last Wednesday's session is was is just um, one that. You, you, you have to question and you have to challenge uh, the status quo if you're going to come up with something that's new and different and innovative. It's just part of the creativity and innovation process. And so, uh, it's for me, uh, I think one of the, the great um, attributes of Joseph Smith is that he was such an amazing question. And if you look at most of the revelations that came to him that are viewed as quite innovative for religion. Um, you know, basic things like, um, so help me understand what heaven's about here. Because I don't quite get, you know, sort of like, I don't quite get this. It's like, you know, you either sort of make it or you don't. You know, heaven and hell, how, how does that work, right? And, and Jesus is, you know, talking about many mansions, and how does that work? So, you know, he... He asks these questions and then he goes to the source to try and see what inspiration he could get around the, the, the answers. And I think, um, you know, we certainly see this with, uh, with Joseph F. Smith, with his vision of the celestial kingdom. Once again, trying to understand and ask questions and understand, you know, what is, you know, what goes on in this next life? How does this work? And I think, um, I think for us, it's really important that we feel um, comfortable asking the questions. And I think in a religious setting, it's, it's asking really in faith that there's an answer. Um, and that we're trying to understand as best we can while we're here, realizing that we, you know, we, we aren't going to have full knowledge. Um, but that you're asking, and then you're trying to answer as best you can uh, in faith. And, and so, uh, for those of you who read my response to Sid, Sid Winter, where you know he had sort of these questions about, were um, you know were we Mormons doing the right thing um, by trying to you know define marriage as between a man and a woman, and and do, you know you know have we been bigots and, and so a lot of times people you don't understand the full story. And, and you have to understand and, and realize that. And I'm not sure I understand the full story, but at least for those of you who read it, um, that's, this is my view a bit on sort of why, uh, you know, answers to some of those questions. And hopefully that might have been helpful to some of you. But, but I know when, when, when Sid was a friend of mine, when he raised this concern, you know, I flew to Philadelphia. I had dinner with him. I tried to understand what his concerns were. And why, right? Because uh, that's, I, I feel like that's a much better way to try and, uh, under, rather than responding in email, you know, with, a, well, <laughs> here's the answer, you know, first. Instead, I, I tried to fly back, spend some time with them, understand the issues. Then we decided together it would make sense for us to each sort of write something that we could share with sort of the collective group um, and, and do this on a website, which we then, so I then wrote. What, you, what I sent to you, he wrote then something else that he shared, and we're able to then have a, a discussion um, with uh, perhaps differing opinions, but at least one where we, we tried to do it, where, where we were trying to understand each other. Where's what he wrote? What's that? Where's what he wrote? Um, I have a copy of that, if you want to see that. Can we send that to you? Yeah. Yeah, let me yeah. see if I, I'll, uh, uh, It was on the website, but I think he sent me I think he sent me a hard copy of, uh, of what he wrote, so I'd be happy to share that. <clears throat> so, um, so questioning is, is an important sort of early skill if you're trying to be a creative problem solver. All right, so what I want to do first today is I want to talk about IDEO, Innovation Design Firm. Um, I, I had you watch the, that video on your own because sometimes people might have seen that in a class or somewhere else. Had anybody seen that before? Okay, so I figured a lot of people have seen this. Um, and I want to I want to make sure we, we understand the lens. We want to make sure that we understand the process that IDEO uses to come up with innovative designs for clients. 
So, <clears throat> so let's just start. In fact, maybe I'll start with with Carrie up here. So Carrie, tell let's think about. This, the process that they went through to redesign the shopping cart. What was the first, what was the, sort of the first thing they did as a group? Um, I guess, well, I, can't, I can't remember specifically the first thing they did, but just for, it was talking about the process of, of the company as a whole. Um, for every, everything they do, they have their like human approach, design-based thinking. Um, so they all would, you know, get together and it talked about the difference between innovators and designers and how the, by thinking as designers, they were able to, um, So that's a real question. What does it mean to think like a designer? What do they teach you? When, if, you if you've heard this term design thinking, what does that, what does that mean? To think like a designer. Anybody know? Robert? Well, so I was a graphic design student at TCU, and I always felt like that when they taught about, uh, it, was, it felt a little bit like uncovering a solution. <coughs> so it was, uh, so you, it's kind of archaeological in a sense. Like you'd start out and you'd do some, you'd do a big scoop of dirt, and none of those sketches would ever turn out to be anything, but you just kind of started, and you just kept exploring until you got down into the started refining into some designs. I always looked at it like that, like there were layers and you were working your way down to some solution that already existed and you were just finding it. You're finding it. So somehow you're discovering yeah. what is a great solution. All right, so and then there's this question of how do you know it's a good solution yet, right, when you get there. Um, let's go back, uh, Kina. So the IDEO team, they get together, they've got to start to redesign the shopping cart, right? What 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 was the first what was the first thing they did? What was the first step that they took? Um, I'm not sure if this was the first one, but when they got like really impressed, I thought at the beginning how much they like, went out and observed. Like, okay. So they went out and like just like watched people and like looked up just like hazards of it and just like knew everything about like the process of like something. Like, okay. So if we think about you think about this as the sort of the processes they use. One of the things we know is they, they went out and they did some observations of people in the stores. Yeah. And they also, they said they, they went, they talked to the buzzes of the world. Yes. Right, just the average people using shopping carts to try and understand them. What did they do before they went out? Tyson? They just like brainstormed what they thought were concerns. With the, with the original. <coughs> okay, so they brainstorm concerns with the the, uh, the current, the original shopping cart. It's like, what should we be looking for? In fact, did you notice some of the things they asked? They actually were asking questions like, how big is this theft thing? Um, how big, uh, how many people get injured? How big is this injury problem issue? So they first of all they get together and they sort of they're sort of brainstorming, but they're questioning what's wrong with the existing shopping cart. What should we what might we be looking for when we go out to do the observations? Okay, so so if you think about it's it's sort of their own uh, way of doing this. I think of it, it was a little bit like question storming. But it is really questioning what are the problems, what are the issues with the current product, and what should we be, what should we consider looking for as we go out there. So they they question um, the current product, and they're trying to identify uh, issues or problems. All right, and then after that, you think about sort of those next steps. Kina's right, they go out and they do the observations, right? And they talk to people. So now they've in in initiated an observing process and a networking process. So this is where you're going out and you're collecting data try and better understand 
the issues that you think you've identified in your initial brain in the initial brainstorming session. So they go out, they take pictures, right? You see they've got video cameras, all that stuff. They're trying to really understand what's going on. All right. And well, what do they do after that? Yeah, it was sort of the experimenting thing. They broke up into smaller groups and each made like prototypes based on one particular aspect like safety and technology and construction. Yeah, then they go ahead and they prototype possible solutions. And in this case, once again, they broke up into different groups. Right? And what was the why did they do did they all did they all just try and come up with their own design from the different groups or what were the instructions for the different groups? Yeah, how to design the specific problem or yeah. key attribute that they wanted to then. Yeah, so so what they're trying to do is they were trying to get the different teams to optimize on a different problem associated with the shopping cart. So, you know, all right, what would the what would the safest shopping cart that you could make look like? Right, what would the shopping cart that's easiest to check out with? What features would that have? How would you know? How would you change that? Right, and so um, so they prototype, and um, and what what feeds into that prototype? And this is where there's sort of a, a step here. I think we put the deep dive. Right, they have this step here where they have this deep dive brainstorming. Now we're going to get all the ideas out of what we learned from observing and networking, and now we're going to use those as a way to come up with different prototypes. So they prototype, and they have, in this case, they have four different <coughs> prototypes that are developed. So again, multiple prototypes. So think back on the process that we used here. If I were trying to get a a, a new strategy for Sears or Redbox. I don't want you to all work together. I want to break you up and I want to have you each work separately because I want to get variation. <coughs> I want lots of different ideas to draw from to be able to come up with something that's new, creative, innovative. All right, <coughs> so they do their deep dive brainstorming and then they come up with multiple prototypes. And then what do they do after that? <coughs> Besides cheer for their how good they've done. You know, <laughs> yay, we did such a good job. But what do they what do they do after that? Yeah, they bring them all back together, and they the more you use, they take a step back from the extreme idea that they have, and then merge them into. So so now they go from from uh, the four prototypes. They bring sort of pieces of each into one prototype, and then what do they do at the at the end of the the video with that one prototype? Take it to the store. Yeah, they take it out. So then, then you start to take it out, and you give people to respond to it and see what they think. Usually, what you're going to find is that you're going to go through this sort of prototyping. Uh, you're going to this process. You're going to go three, probably three times. Um, you, it could go four, but as Kelly notes in the video, you got to cut it off at some point in time because we got to have a product, right? But think about it, your first design is your sort of first shot at what you think is the best thing. So you're probably gonna, you're gonna probably make more changes and iterations to that first prototype than you will the second. Um, and then you get, you're gonna get diminishing returns to each new, each additional prototype because you've gotten closer and closer what you think might work. So this was like their first shot at it. And they would take that back, they'd iterate, and then they'd come up with something new and that's gonna become a lot closer. Usually by the time you get about to the third version of the prototype, you're like, we could continue to iterate on this, but um, you're probably pretty close and um, to, to what's likely to work in the market. Let's get it out there, and then you'll start something new. But, but this is really where then they go into, I think of all of this as the experimenting. <coughs> and by the way, the deep dive is all about associational thinking. <coughs> In fact, I don't know if you noticed in the video, but did you notice they were pulling out like that it's like some slinkies and airplanes and things they were putting on the desk? Does anybody know what that's all about? Yeah, so here it is. I don't know exactly what they call it, but like this random idea box. Let's take random things, let's take all the stuff we've learned from the current problem, let's see what associations we can make from introducing. Yeah, they have what they call a tech box. 
it, would, it just has a wide variety of different objects, shapes, things, you know, like some slinkies, airplanes, and they put them out there on the desk while they're brainstorming. And the point is, maybe, maybe by seeing an object, it will spur an idea. It's <coughs> triggered new, different associations. You know, so I don't know where the guy came up with. One guy who was coming up with the uh, the SUV um, design for the the shopping cart. So my, you know, my I know my kids would have preferred the ATV version <laughs> of that, or the Razor, you know, the you know the dune buggy version of that. <coughs> um, but uh, but you know those ideas have to come from somewhere, and so they pull out those things from the tech box as a regular course when they are brainstorming because they're trying to trigger new different associations, and they know that sometimes that sometimes helps. It's like well, what does a slinky or an airplane have to do with a shopping cart? Well, I don't know. What does a microwave have to do with a dishwasher? Right? You're trying to you're trying to sort of get inspiration. From things, what does a block have to do with a, you know, an iPod? You're trying to get some inspiration from things you see, and, and visual is very important. So I think it's interesting if you look at the process they use, they really engage the the five skills um, throughout the process to try to come up with the creative solution. I thought it was interesting too how they bring in people from all different disciplines too. I think that falls into networking also kind of throughout. The yeah. Way. Okay. So. So that, that actually leads to, let's think about the people, that, um, the characteristics of the people that they bring on the team. So Seth, yeah, t tell me, so, because I, I, I want to make sure that we, we understand the other things that sort of help with the processes. So one is, what are the characteristics of the people, and then we'll talk about the, the philosophies that they use to guide their work. So, People, what, what's the what's the takeaway on the people? From they have a variety of different backgrounds yeah. and expertise. Yeah, diverse backgrounds, right? We're talking about engineering, marketing, what else? Biologists. Biologists. Med school. Med school. Psychology. Psychology, anthropologists. You know, I mean, you're, you're really trying to have people from a wide variety of backgrounds who are on this particular team. Now, I had the chance to work with IDEO um, on our innovation, the Innovators Accelerator. That's the innovation course that I've showed you little clips on. Um, our project lead, um, guess what her background was? Anybody have an idea? Or did I tell you already? What do you think would be the background of the project lead for an, innovate, an online innovation course? Biology, engineer. She had a PhD in human computer interaction. Now, I didn't even know you could get a PhD in human computer interaction. Right? But, but you kind of think about it a little bit and you're like, hmm, that's probably not a bad idea. I mean, think about how people are consuming an online innovation course. Right? It's all through your computer, it's human computer interaction. So to have someone who really understands how people engage and learn through the computer to be on, you know, on at least on the project, if not the project lead, would make some sense. Um, we had someone on the team who had a master's in storytelling. Once again, I didn't know you could get a master's in storytelling. I uh, think that my kids think that would be great if they could get a master's in stereo, or at least if their parents could get a master's in stereo. I'm assuming this is in you know an English field, right? And somehow it's related. But but once again, you're bringing different kinds of experience. Now this is a very different kind of team than what you find at Innosight, um, which is an innovation consulting firm, one that was founded by Clay. And we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna look at. Uh, of the process they use to work with Godrej, this appliance company in India, um, to come up with uh, a, a new product idea. But, but it's certainly very different than the kind of folks that, that McKinsey and Bain and BCG and, and uh, LDK and PwC and Deloitte, they don't have folks like that, right? On their teams? Who are they hiring? What are the backgrounds? MBAs. Engineers. Engineers. But, 
mostly MBA is mostly business, right? You could have an undergraduate in a different degree if you're an associate consultant, but if you look at most of the folks that get hired to move into the sort of main managerial and partner track at a consulting, at one of the main sort of strategy consulting firms, they are business, they are MBAs. They do not have PhDs in human computer interaction or in storytelling, right? So, so they're looking for a different kind of person. And, um, and, and they're really good at, what they're really good at is structured problem solving. Um, but they're maybe not as good at coming up with things that are sort of outside, sort of outside the box, if you, you know, if you want to call it that. My experience at Bain was that we, we, we rarely came up with anything that was really very creative or innovative. <laughs> um, it happened on occasion. Um, I'll give you an example of one case where I think we did come up with something that was fairly creative and innovative. Um, but um, you'll, you know, when you when you hear the story, you'll you know you'll understand how or why this happens on occasion. So we have um, we had a, a um, an individual being he actually I think was a partner at the time was sort of a uh, a guru expert in manufacturing. Okay, this is the early 1980s. So he is an expert in manufacturing. And at the time, manufacturing clients are starting to disappear from the United States, right? Because we're offshoring. We've been offshoring for 50 years, right? So the stuff's going to China and other places in the 80s. And so um, he, gets sent, he gets sent on a um, visit to a healthcare client, a hospital chain. Think of, think of it as um, like uh, Intermountain Healthcare. So you got a chain, you know, tell me this, you've got a chain of hospitals. They sit down. This chain of hospitals, this is about 1984, 1985. Now, in 1983, in the United States, there were a set of laws passed that changed health care reimbursement. Before 1983, those were the glory days for doctors and health care reimbursement. Why were they the glory days? Because pricing to customers was all based upon cost plus. In other words, you add up your costs, you add 10%, that's the price that goes to the patient and gets paid by the insurance companies. Now, how good is that? It means if you're high cost, you make more money. Right? If you're inefficient, you make more money. And the insurance companies and the government finally decided that was probably not a great system for motivating healthcare providers to try and lower their costs. <clears throat> so they went to what they call fixed cost reimbursement. Um, and and this, these were what they called the diagnostic related groups where you break your leg, depending a little bit on the region of the, co uh, of the country and, and, and wages and that in that region, we're going to pay you, you know, $800 to set a leg. And that's fixed cost. And if you can't make money on that, tough. But it's going to go to fixed cost reimbursement. All of a sudden, hospitals have to care a little bit about efficiency and doing things at low cost. So, um, so this partner, he goes on this visit because he knows something about manufacturing cost reduction anyway. And they're talking with the hospital um, administrators about cost reduction. And he starts to ask them about throughput. And um, the, number of, uh, the, um, the number of touches to the patient where someone's adding value to the patient. And the administrator's eyes start to glaze over because they don't they don't get throughput, right? It's like they don't think about you know patients as throughput. And he starts to apply a manufacturing lens to this. And he says, No, you, you don't understand. What you're designing to do is, you know, you're trying to keep it quality, but that means what you're trying to do is you're trying to have people come in and stay as long as possible to make sure everything's good and that you get as many expenses in there as possible. And then you get them out. What you want to do is you want to have them come in. You want to have very few but only value-added touches, value-added happen to the patient, and then you want to get them out the door, just like you want to get a product in the manufacturing plant through and out the door. It's a very new concept for hospitals. 
But this actually turned out to be a huge business for Bain in the 1980s and early 90s. At one point, there were, were like 65 different hospital <coughs> clients that were, that were using these concepts. And what you've seen over the last 25 years is now hospitals try, or they try and get you in and out as quickly as possible. You know, they don't want you to die. But they want to get you in, and they want you to stay as little time as possible. And they want to get you out. And they're also trying, they're doing a lot better job of looking at sort of the number of sort of value added. If you're going to add value to a patient with some sort of service, you want to make sure, how do we make sure that we bunch those, that we get those to happen, and that we get you out the door. That was, I think, pretty, that was more innovative. An innovative way to think about managing a hospital. But it came because someone had worked and was an expert in one environment, and then they brought it, and they were able to apply it in a completely different environment in a different way. And that does happen sometimes. So, but IDEO is trying to do something different with people with very diverse backgrounds. Okay, what else did you notice about their people? T-shaped. Okay, T-shaped. Tell me about. So, a T-shaped person has a deep knowledge in one area and a broad experience base. I suppose, like your human-computer interaction PhD. Mm -hmm. Maybe she also had a minor in business and a minor in psychology mm -hmm. and Good. worked in the oil industry. So these people they had very different expertise, but they also seemed to be deep, but they also had some breadth in different areas. Okay, what else about <laughs> those folks that you, did you notice? Yeah, like the talk about how there are people who are comfortable with like, challenging the boss. Uh -huh. There are a lot of people who just nod their heads and say yes to Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, and, and as uh, Kelly, the founder, said, I don't think corporate America is quite ready yet. So you want to hire people who don't listen to you, right? That's, that's, not, that's pretty unusual to think about. You want to hire people who won't do what you say, that don't just listen to the boss. So these are people who are naturally people who sort of challenge the status quo, right? Um, and they feel comfortable with that. And it's like, you know, someone puts a bike up on the ceiling, nobody complains, somebody else does it. That's the way things happen. We're just gonna try, let's try it and see if I get in trouble. It's, you know, and he says, you know, you wanna, you wanna ask for forgiveness rather than permission. Again, many organizations don't like that philosophy. You know, that's chaos, right? You, you know, if people are going out just trying things and not asking permission, uh, that can create a lot of problems. What, what else about the people? Did you notice? Yeah, um, so. It talks about how, like in a traditional work environment, the people that sit at and work at their desks the whole time are usually the most valued workers. But in this case, they want people that are comfortable going out and yeah. kind of experimenting things and talking to people. Like, yeah. So they're really interested in people who are observers and networkers, right? And experimenters um, because they want people who are sort of interacting with the world because those are the folks that will come, come up with the new ideas. Yes. Uh, I guess kind of goes to challenge the status quo. They were talking a lot about, uh, <coughs> you mentioned like the person that has like the highest title or has been there for the longest, that doesn't really matter them. But the person that's really valuable is the person who has the best ideas. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of how they rank people within their company as well. Yeah, so you think about this company as a meritocracy. In other words, why do you get respect in this company? And the answer is, why do you get respect? Good ideas. If you come up with ideas, you get respect. <coughs> But otherwise, it's like you're on a team with somebody. I don't care if you're the boss. It's whoever comes up with the good idea and the recognition that the boss doesn't always have the good ideas. So I think that's another uh, important thing. This is very flat in terms of organization structure. And we're, you know, as Kelly says, you know, I give you a big red balloon. I give you a big desk. What does it matter to me? And it's like that makes you feel good. Fine, but uh, but it's it is very much. This is very much. Uh, a meritocracy, but it's based upon ideas. So people here care about ideas. They don't care about, there's not status that matters there. Yeah. Um, groups, so that they were comfortable in small groups even, that you might say that any, any particular <coughs> problem is never solved by 60 people, and it was always small groups. Of yeah, they're, they're relatively small teams, they work together, and did you notice one of the philosophies that I think was important to getting them to work together as a team? 
it was built on the ideas of others, right? So it's this is the way we come up with great ideas is we build on the ideas of others. That means it becomes a team idea. It's so people aren't owning it and saying, "Well, wait, wait, no, this is my idea," or they get pushing their own idea because they want credit. <laughs> so I think one of the important philosophies here, especially around teams, is was built on the ideas of others. Other other philosophies that they had. Uh, yeah. Don't reject an idea. Basically, no matter what, they include. They showed uh, one person suggesting like Velcro pants. Right. Which is totally yeah, like right. Bizarre. Yeah. It seems yeah. It's like you, you, you put something on and you Velcro to the thing. But you encourage wild ideas. I think was one of the explicit things they put. We want to encourage wild ideas. We'll back off on them later if we need to. But yeah, we want to encourage. Wild ideas. Um, you kind of mentioned it, but it was like the do now, repent later type thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you want to ask, it really was ask forgiveness, oh, yeah, that was <laughs> not permission. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of you are probably, you see this and you're smiling, <coughs> because this is really, this is not our culture. <laughs> now, our culture is not, let's ask for forgiveness, not permission to do things. That's, this is this is very uncomfortable. This is very uncomfortable for me. I still would want to ask for permission, right? Is it okay if I do this? Um, and I think there are ways you can do it. But the I, the notion here is this is this is really a bias for action, right? This is what they're really saying is we want a bias for action. We want people who are going to throw out ideas and are going to try new things. That's really what he's looking for. That's what's important. So That's I have a question for you, Dr. Dyer. So as we focus on IDEO and learn new practices and work with <coughs> innovators DNA, I'm imagining sitting down in an interview at McKinsey, Bain, or BCG and saying, you know, I really think one of my greatest skills is uh, questioning my boss. And I'm really good at asking for forgiveness rather than permission. <laughs> like, how? I guess I'm trying to understand how can we communicate this? So, so the question is, about are you wanting to signal this in an interview? <laughs> yeah, like how, how can we... So this is where you have to understand the culture yeah. of the organization that you're interviewing with. Now, if, if I were interviewing with IDEO, I would, want about, I would want to talk about times when I was willing, I would try new things, I struck out on my own, um, action-oriented, um, this is something that was different, divergent. I would probably want to talk about that more at IDEO then maybe I would at McKinsey. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's the sort of understanding in part the culture. At the same time, and I've told you this from Bain and Company, at Bain, you know, I, and I'm not sure the extent uh, that they still teach this to, to new hires, but it was listen, execute, add value. Three steps, one, two, three. Don't just listen and execute. Add value means that you have questioned what should be done and what needs to be done. Now what you can do in an interview is you can say, I think one of my strengths is I, don't, I, I not only listen to what needs to be done from my boss and I try and execute on that, but I try and add value to it. I try and think, I try and think on my own as I'm gathering data what was missed in terms of the instructions? What else should we be doing here that could add value? And then I'll try and see if I can bring new insights to bear related to that problem. Because my experience personally is as people get into solving a problem and you start to gather data, you're closest to what's going on. That will generate questions for you. You can just listen and execute. But if you can add value, then that means you're probably asking questions about what needs to be done, how it should be done, and you can pitch yourself as someone who I, you know, can do that. So I think you can actually pitch yourself as someone who can add value. But <clears throat> this is a, this is a, that's a different pitch for a consulting firm, right? Rather than saying I'm going to question the boss, right? I'm going to add value. Uh, that's sort of the language that they would they would use. Because I think you're right. They're not necessarily looking for people who are going to not do what the boss says um, you should do. Okay. All right, um, other philosophies that you saw from IDEO. 
Um, they have like long stretches of democracy and are supposed to be short stretches of autonomy. Yeah. There was a long stretch of, we think about democracy, everyone votes, right? Everyone votes and everyone gets an equal vote. That's the other thing, is that it's the team that's going to figure out the best solution. And this tends to work, uh, I think, better when, you're, when it's a design company, because you're designing for the masses for a large group. And therefore, the team is more likely to know what the group, what the masses will want, as opposed to an individual. This may be less true with invention than it is with design. Um, invention, maybe the lone every once in a while, the, the the lone wolf, it actually does have the insight that will you know whether it's Einstein or somebody else, they may they might have an insight that the team wouldn't necessarily have. So that kind of happened in my work recently. Actually, we, we did a, we had a project at the beginning of the semester, and there wasn't really any democracy. There were no inputs or anything, and the thing happened, and everybody hated. It. Everybody's like, "What's going on? Why are we doing this?" And now we're doing it again at the end of the semester, and it's like a whole new revamp thing. Everybody put in their idea, and it's awesome. Everybody loved it. It's really interesting to watch that happen. That process, this pro the process really matters, and that's one thing that I'm trying to help you uh, understand and appreciate is that your um, you, we've been giving you a lot of content. Frameworks, theories, cases. Now, one of the reasons I want to I want to give you a lot is because now you've got things to associate when you run into a problem. You could say, "Oh, well, let me get that Redbox thing." You know, maybe we could pull this idea from Redbox, or it could be Southwest, or it could be Walmart, or it could be. You know, you might be able to draw on that idea. You get these associations because now you have a lot more on the shelf, the brain shelf here to associate, to draw upon, and that's part of why we want to do that. But I also want you to understand now a process that you can use individually and with your teams that will help you to come up with better solutions to the problems that are faced. So <clears throat> we have a set, of, a set of philosophies that are important <clears throat> as well for helping you feel comfortable um, with trying new things. And um, they did have built on the, you know, the ideas of others, um, one other one we haven't talked about, fail soon to what? To succeed sooner, right? <clears throat> so it's like fail soon. You're going to fail along the right. You're going to be wrong early on, and they want you to let's be wrong quickly. Let's get it out there. Let's iterate. Let's uncover. It's sort of the design thinking. We're going to be wrong, but we're, you know, we're digging to find the right solution, the perfect thing. And so let's fail. Let's get it out there and start to iterate. OK. All right. Um, I now want you to watch, uh, we're going to watch a video clip, and this is going to, um, this is going to describe a little bit the process used by InnoCite with Godrej as they try and come up with this idea for this small refrigerator in India. So we'll watch this, we'll talk a little bit about their process, and then we'll, we'll wrap up from there. Economists often talk about a trickle-down effect. If the wealthy get wealthier, they will spend more of their money, and so prosperity will trickle down. But a much better way to think about it is inclusive growth. By making products and services so much more affordable, the quality of their life improves, and inclusive growth, I believe, will change the whole of India for the better much more quickly than would a trickle-down effect. Well, I've been going to India for 15 years now, and I think as an outsider, maybe I can see things that if you're in the middle of it, you don't see as clearly. But the most dominant thing is that this nation is really on the move. Mumbai has become one of the most expensive places in the whole world to live. What you see is that the slums are receding from view. 
And very quickly, you come to the downtown area where the buildings are comparable to the ones that you run into in Singapore or Seoul or the United States. In the country, it's like people assume that the way things are today is the way they're always going to be. And if I work harder or if I work longer, it's not going to change much. The way it is is the way it always will be. Godridge is a 115 year old company and we've really sort of grown with India. Traditionally, we've been a manufacturing oriented company being more consumer centric in your mindset. I think that's a huge cultural change that we are trying to, to bring about. You can make anything, but you don't necessarily know what to make because you don't understand the user's needs very well. And I think the innovation process is bridging that gap. Godridge built itself around a prestige brand. And they made these little boxes that were very safe. The women who had enough money to have jewelry wanted to be sure that their jewelry didn't disappear. They expanded by offering more appliances. They would bring things from abroad like refrigeration and sell it to the very small proportion of the population that could afford those things. Then Godridge in appliances got disrupted. Foreign companies like LG from Korea brought into the market lower cost products that were as good as Godridge. And they started to disrupt Godridge. And Godridge continued to grow, but their share of the market, because they were disrupting, was diminishing every year. I think it was uh, to my father's credit to, to bring in Clayton and you know recognize that we needed to do something new and that it, incremental innovation was only going to get us so far. If we are going to sort of take those to the next level and to the next stage of growth that it was only going to be through disruptive innovations. The better way to go after LG and people like that is to disrupt them by coming underneath them with an even simpler product that could be sold for a much larger population of people. This was a very new idea for Godridge. From the very beginning in my engagement in India, we've done it with Innocite as my partner because Innocite has the scope to stay with companies as they start on this journey and, and just help them succeed. Clayton and the Innocite team were sort of very insistent on focusing on non-users and what are the unique aspects of people that don't today buy refrigerators. The name Shotagul also came up during the first workshop that we did with Innocite and it's a name that just stuck, everybody fell in love with it and it's a name we still use today. It translates into Hindi, it means little cool. We imagined we would be making a shrunken down version of the refrigerator, make it smaller, make it cheaper. We had preconceived notions of how to build a brand that resonated with this user through big promotions and fancy ad campaigns. Why wouldn't a kid in rural India want the same things that a kid growing up in the city has? We wanted a design for this group. With all this in mind, we began our research, which was a long and fascinating journey. We were surprised by many things, we were shocked by many things. It made us happy sometimes. It also made us kind of bummed out, faced with this incredible complexities of life in rural India. I think the first biggest learning was that in order to design for these users, you have to spend enough time with them. I think that was a huge eye-opener, taking the design team to the villages. That's a very critical step that does not get addressed in a lot of companies. The critical skills in creating new growth products, one is you have to observe. And it's funny how many people in life don't look to the left and don't look to the right. You need to see what they're doing. And then you've got to ask yourself, why are they doing this? You, you don't understand 
what jobs are arising in people's lives if you're not there observing. The reason is that a lot of times in their own minds they can't articulate why they're doing what they're doing because they're so accustomed to it. Every job has these three dimensions, a functional job, a social job, an emotional job, allows you to say, oh my gosh. So if this is what the job is, what are all of the experiences that we've got to provide to the customer to nailing the job perfectly? And that model is really at the key of innovation here. Here's what we saw. They buy what they need for each day, or they do it every other day. They generally go to the nearest vendor. Uh, but buying fruit and vegetables every day is time consuming and expensive. They're also unable to plan. They have to cook in small quantities. It's inconvenient. Rohini here buys the vegetables she requires from a nearby vendor, but at a higher rate as compared to the weekly market because she's unable to store them for a longer period. It's also difficult for them to store food overnight. Temperatures in many of these areas are in the 90s, uh, almost year round in some of the places we visited. So often food goes bad, making them sick. Very often the only means of getting around is on foot. The well is very far from the village, so ladies have to get up very early every morning to fill water. Also, many of the villages we were in do not have continuous access to power. So in the summer months, sometimes getting only eight hours of power every day, she has to regularly juggle all these balls in a very dim light. And as we plunged deeper into the research, we realized our original hypothesis was quite wrong. So we knew we couldn't just repackage and reconfigure an existing refrigerator and just pass that off. The third tool is networking. In almost every problem that we looked at, there's somebody else in some part of the world in a different industry that has solved a problem like that. And if you're a good networker, you're meeting with people in all kinds of different ways of life, so you feel a very strong sense of community in these villages. Women of the village regularly get together, not only to discuss politics and village gossip, but also to help each other. In many villages, women's self-help groups are a support system for women. Communities and groups are hugely influential in the purchases they make as well. The product now was seen as more of a means to the larger goal, empowering women empowering these people by giving them the opportunity to sell the product as well. The success of Chotupul was directly linked to the success of these women. They've put together technologies from two very different industries, from cooling and computers, and at that intersection became a product that is just remarkable. We needed to build a cooler that was able to store essentials for a typical family of four for about one to two days. Not a feature-loaded refrigerator. A small footprint, it needed to be lightweight and easy to lift when repurposing areas within the home. They needed to keep vegetables and milk fresh for about, at about five to 10 degrees Celsius. It needed to be top opening, which prevents high loss of cold air every time the lid is opened. We knew we wanted to put all the electrical parts into the lid it would save them the trouble of carrying the entire machine to the service center. Instead, they only need to remove the lid. It needed to operate on a battery as well because of the frequent power outages. It needed to be low on energy consumption, which was an issue we tried to solve by removing the traditional compressor and replacing it with solid state thermoelectric cooling. And we started building prototypes. And when we were ready, we brought those prototypes back into the village. To launch the first version of Chotukul, we did it at a village fair. And we partnered with local nonprofits and local women's groups who bust about 600 women into this big tent. Here you see the women carrying in Chotukul on their shoulders, singing local folk songs. For us, it was also a way to get instant feedback about the product. The fair was really an opportunity for us to co-create with these women who shared their thoughts on things like size, uh, desired temperature drop, how to communicate this value proposition. And it was really at this Mela that everything came together. It was also here that the final color that we went with, ruby red, 
was decided pretty unanimously by 600 women. These women were there because they were interested in learning about how Chotrapur could improve their quality of life. These were our customers, but they were also our future sales force. Another really important tool in the Innovator's Toolkit is experimentation. And this is a very simple idea that I think Innocite taught me as much as I taught them. And that is that when you want to build a new business, the probability that you know the right strategy is only about 7%. And 93% of the time their original strategy was wrong. And what that means is revise your strategy to address what you just found. And if you don't get out in the world and experiment, you just have no source of insight or data about which you can keep moving forward. So there are a lot that you just couldn't know about, about the Chota Cool. Um, one of them is, gee, is this a community asset? Most of the shopkeepers <laughs> in a rural area, they don't have refrigeration. That means that they can't sell meat uh, on more than a one-day turnaround. They can't sell Diet Coke. It enabled them to, to sell other products like ice cream. We started seeing Chotukul getting absorbed by the local and rural retailers. And that was not initially one of the users that we were looking at, but it provides a lot of benefits to, to small kiosk retailers who can then you know, s sell uh, cooled beverages for a slightly higher price. Um, it's, it's helpful for uh, vendors that sell dairy products who can you know, sell chocolate during the summer months for the first time. Most of these people actually don't have a bank account. How are they going to pay for something that costs you know, US dollars 40 to, or 50 to 60 dollars? How many people actually have that money around? We need to give them through micro lending access to credit so that they can own this and then because they saved so much money by having this uh, so that you don't lose things through spoilage it actually generates plenty of money to pay off the financing of it we partnered with india post that you see here because they have a huge reach uh, they are present in almost every village in india and in many villages, the post office is the main doorway to uh, the outside world. And the postman is more like a friend who's invited inside the home for a cup of tea. And postmen as well are going to earn an additional income from selling the product. We developed our own framework with which we can you know, look at future businesses, which we now call our 3L vision. The 3L stand for uh, living standard, lifestyle and livelihood. And if you look at Chotukul, it's improving living standard because it's allowing families to store you know, food for an extended period of time. Uh, it's improving lifestyle because it's allowing kids to you know, enjoy a cold beverage for the first time you know, when they come home from school. Every kid wants to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's also improving livelihood by putting earning power into the hands of the user. It's certainly helped us frame how we look at the bottom of the pyramid and you know, building a more inclusive society. I really do think that this idea of Chota Cool is bringing to Godridge the possibility of transforming the whole company. They can just put Chota blank. And how do you see what to fill in the blank? Oh my goodness, sitting in that perspective allows you to see there are so many opportunities in the future for Godrej. It's just exciting. What we need to do is transform things that were available only to the rich so that the poor can improve their standard of living. I really think that inclusive growth as a strategy is much more powerful than the other theories of development that you've ever seen taught or practiced in the world.
So, um, once again, think about the, the process that we saw in a site using with GoDredge. And how did that compare to what we saw at, at IDEO? Similar, different? Well, it's similar because it thought, like, well, what's, what's the problem with the regular refrigerator right now? Like, why can't why can't they have it now with the little amount of power? It's Big, it's too, too costly. So they said, okay, how do we resolve those problems? Yeah, and the, and then they and the, the first step then is to do what? Observe. Observe. Yeah. Then they go out. So they, they sort of know their prob they, you know they know their problems with the existing product. But then again, they get out, they observe, right? They network, they talk to people using a ver very similar process. They came back. They use that to brainstorm. Um, and uh, and and then they start to they start prototyping, and the early prototypes they brought all these women in to help them to look at the prototypes. You saw that, you know the one prototype was you could actually see into it completely. The other ones were you know red gray. They said that the women unanimously <laughs> voted on red ruby red was <laughs> like the the color that worked. And, and those are things that you know you really don't you wouldn't get necessarily until you're trying to co-create this product with users. And that's part of what they're, what they're trying to do, is, is use this process to help co-create with users. So I, I wanted you to see that. One, because I think it's interesting to see this uh, process applied in a different part of the world, you know, with a different kind of product. Um, I also love the, the notion of inclusive growth. And if you can come up with ideas that help those at the bottom of the pyramid, you know, those folks who are poor, um, and you can improve their lives and make money doing it. How great is that, right? It, it, this is, um, you know, I think one of the one of the things we learned is that these these are the kinds of products that really improve um, improve people's lives. And um, nonprofits are great for doing things, um, but for profits um, also are great for providing jobs. Um, and providing you know products that improve the lives of, of folks from around around the world. So, um, and uh, one of the things that was innovative here was not just the product, right? The distribution channel, right? Did you think that was that's interesting? The post office. So we, all we think about the post office here, uh, office here is that it's inefficient, right? <laughs> and it's always being subsidized. That's all we think about is the post office. But no. Think about it. I actually had a conversation with um, Pierre Omidyar, the founder of eBay, uh, about this for a, a few minutes uh, a, a while back. And um, he, you know, he understands the value of the post office because eBay has, you know, so many people basically use the post office for a lot of the transfers of their products, right? Um, between users of eBay. But we we're talking about wow. Think about, is there any other organization in the United States that delivers something to your home almost every day? Right? I mean, I don't know that anybody's they've ever looked at what other value could be created by the distribution channel that the post office might be able to be. Um, but it'd be interesting if, if someone actually, I mean, I think that they just think of it as the post office. Um, but this could be a very interesting, different, ch you know, challenge. I mean, I, I don't know, I don't know whether, uh, you know, this is the way Amazon Fresh, you know, you deliver groceries or, uh, but you could imagine there could be some real opportunities if you thought about using those, the post office assets in new and different ways. They could create some value. So, um, anyway, uh, the, the, the process, hopefully now you're, you're pretty familiar with this process of starting out by really questioning, understanding the problem, then you get out and you do the observing and the networking, and then you do the, the, the associational thinking where you, you brainstorm solutions, and then you start to develop the prototypes that you then take out, and then you know you basically go back through this process. You take the prototype and you, you, you question the pros and cons of it, you get people to observe it, you talk to people about it, 
and that's the way you iterate to, to improve the solution that you come up with. Now, at the organization level, what we actually found in our research, and this is really part two of the innovator's DNA, um, we're, we're not going to really, we're not going to read this in class, but I've recommended it as summer reading, is that the question then is, well, what are the characteristics of not just people who are innovative, but organizations that are innovative, or teams that are innovative, like an IDEO team? And what we find is that what we call the three Ps are really important to an innovative team or organization. So you got to have people that possess some of these characteristics. And you are going to have to have people who are good at the implementation execution side. You can't just sit and brainstorm all day. You actually, you do have to execute. You got to have, you got to use so the right set of processes to come up with solutions. And they often have to be guided by a set of philosophies that allow people to take risks to try new things. Um, so let me just share with you <clears throat> a little bit about sort of what we've learned about innovation performance in terms of team organization level. So when we started this project, we wanted to know which were the most innovative companies in the world. If you wanted to know which were the most innovative companies in the world, what would you do? Honestly, what would you do? You'd Google most innovative companies. That's exactly what we did. <laughs> right? Google most innovative companies. And what came up? Google. Google. <laughs> Um, actually, it was Business Week's most innovative companies. <laughs> Business Week has a list of most innovative companies. We thought, okay, that was interesting. This was, um, we've been doing some research. This was between the 2005-2010 time period, so we tracked their list each year. And then over the five-year time period, we found we looked, listed the top ten most innovative companies in the world over that time period, according to the Business Week list. Number one, Apple. Seems reasonable. Number two. Google, right? See, they're there. So far, okay. And then you get three, Microsoft. Some people are like, yeah. Some people are like, no, I'm not sure I believe Microsoft. Four was Toyota. Five was General Electric. Six was Procter & Gamble. IBM. And then when you get to Nokia, <laughs> people started going, hmm, I'm not sure I believe Nokia is the most, one of the most innovative companies in the world anymore. They might have been. Sony. Hmm, maybe once upon a time. All right, so now you're like, what's going on? How is this list created? And when you go and you look at the list, it's created by surveying executives in business, and they rank them. So this is based upon individuals' perceptions based upon past performance. And you have to know about it. Okay, so we thought, is there a way we could rank companies in a more innovative way <laughs> that actually might be more accurate? So here's what we did. We said, well, let's think about two companies. What if you were investing? Would you invest in Sony or Amazon based upon expectations of future growth in income streams? Okay, how many in here would pick Sony? Okay, good. I didn't want to have to have you leave the room. <laughs> so see, we're dumb enough to pick Sony. So, so you'd pick, if you're, actually, if you're actually investing your own money, you'd put it in Amazon, right? Why? Why Amazon? Yeah. So like they get people better. They're, they're giving us what we want. Yeah, they're, they're doing a better job of giving us what they want. Yeah. So it's a more relevant service. That <clears throat> Maybe it's more relevant service. Um, they're actually competing in some of the similar spaces now today a little bit. But we, we, we just, we're seeing more new things come from them. Phil? Not only that, um, you see their social innovation projects and other ways that they might totally redefine the industry and think, wow, well, maybe one day something big is going to come. Right, right. So we're just, we just sort of, and you all know this, and you're not professional investors. But we decided, well, what, how would it, uh, which one would you pick? And if you're a professional investor, which one would you pick? So let's look at people who are actually investing. So here's what we did. We, we basically developed a methodology. This is with Credit Suisse, um, a division of theirs called Holt. Um, and you look at the income stream, the NPV from existing businesses. And let's assume that results in a stock price of $100. $100 times the shares outstanding will give you the net present value of the income streams from existing businesses. Now, let's look at the market value of the company, the actual market value. What if it's above that? In Amazon's case, 
we found that in, in effect it was the price at $150. So there was a 50% premium above the cash flows from the existing business. So this is the premium paid because investors are expecting future innovations that generate even bigger income streams. Does that make sense? So in effect, we're, we're crowdsourcing the vote. Just like we're, we're, we're getting a vote, but we're getting investors to vote with their wallets. What are they investing? We feel like that's probably a better way than just executives voting on which ones they think are most innovative. Yes? So how would this apply in things like Twitter? Or like Facebook where you have companies that, like Twitter for example, IPL, it's a big kind of embellishment of it, but the innovativeness of it wasn't really so, so what you, so uh, the way we do this, you have to have at least seven years of data after a company's gone public. So there has to be a little bit of the die down of whatever hype there might be from the initial innovation, right? And, and a settling of the cash, of, of what the cash flows are gonna be from that business. And then you see, and then see what investors are thinking. So we have a set of criteria that we use. Um, we have to exclude companies like mining companies that if you strike gold or you you know that's something where it's raw materials or things that could create a spike in your stock price, it doesn't have anything to do with innovation. There are certain sectors we have to exclude. Um, but there's there's information about that in chapter seven of the Innovators DNA that describes this. So we ranked our set of companies, and these were the first year we did it, our top five. Number one, Salesforce.com. 73% premium. Then Amazon. Number three, intuitive surgical. Anybody know who Intuitive Surgical is? Intuitive Surgical makes the Da Vinci system robots for robotic assisted surgery. These robots actually perform surgery on you. Manipulated by, they have four arms, manipulated by a surgeon. Um, but it's a way you can have somebody in the United States, you know, here in Provo could operate someone in a rural area or in Afghanistan or somewhere else, as long as the robot was there. That's where they're going with this. <clears throat> um, it's very, they're very precise because they filter out hand tremors and things like that. And they give you very good light. I just was reading 70% of all prostate surgeries in the United States um, are performed by the Da Vinci system robots. And they say the reason is that when you're having prostate surgery, you want them to be very, very precise. <laughs> you don't want them making any mistakes when you're having prostate surgery. But you know what? These guys were never ranked in any of the business we surveyed. Why? Nobody knows about them. But investors know about them, and that's why they've propped up on ours. As long as investors know, they're the ones they're doing it. Tencent, Chinese company. A lot of people haven't heard of Tencent. They have 732 million users. <clears throat> so they are like, um, sort of like Facebook of it. They do social media, they do avatars, they do instant messaging, gaming in China. And they are a, a very big company in China. And at the time, Apple was actually number five on the list. <laughs> so I was just thinking, how did, you, how did you filter out the premium for innovation versus other things like business models? Like so data, anything that, any, so, so what you have to do is you have to think about What's not innovation related? And you have to pull that out. So actually, that's why we have to pull out mining companies. We pull, have to pull out um, casino companies. That it's mainly based upon gambling. Things that might produce higher or lower returns that aren't innovation related. But if you think about a new business model, it's an innovation. If, I, if you come up with a great new way to reduce your cost, new process innovation, that's innovation. So this captures all kinds of innovation. Any innovation that is going to increase the cash flows of the business going forward will be captured by this. So it's really looking at the expecting of growth and bigger cash flows going forward in the future. All right. So what's different about innovative companies? <clears throat> um, we'll come back. I'll finish this um, um, on Wednesday. And then we're, we're going to look at the Big Idea Group, which is a, a company. And they, they use a different business model. Um, Networking is an important part of it, um, but we're going to try and sort of look at this uh, with, a, with a specific company, and, um, and I want to make sure you understand, again, the, the characteristics of innovative teams and organizations, um, because that's important as you think about becoming a leader of a team or an organization. We'll see you on Wednesday.